Okay, one of the ways that we mark um, in my house how differently Esther and I grew up uh, is by the telling of jokes. Um, and what I mean by that is I tell my kids jokes, usually a little inappropriate. And Esther doesn't tell jokes because she doesn't know any jokes. Um, but I tell jokes usually inappropriately. And then when I finish telling the joke, I tell Esther how old I was when I learned that joke. And I, I do not know which is more offensive to her, the joke or the age at which I was debaucherous enough to understand that joke. Um, so I thought I would start today with one of those jokes. <laughs> a man died and went to heaven. See, it's a church joke. Um, when he got to the pearly gates, he spoke to Peter. And Peter said this, most of what you've heard about heaven is wrong. Um, the way it works is like this. Whatever you were doing at the moment of your death, um, whether guilty or innocent, determines whether you get it to come in or whether you have to go downstairs. Um, and though confused, the man agrees and he begins to recount the moment of his death. <laughs> he says, I was sitting on a balcony outside my apartment uh, and I was talking on the phone. I was kind of tossing my keys up and down and a toss went crazy and fell off my balcony and, and snagged on a nearby tree. I knew it was dangerous, but I kind of climbed over the rail and I reached out and I tried to get my keys and I fell. And, and I managed to catch myself on the balcony underneath me on my apartment. And I was super relieved <clears throat> and I was starting to pull myself back up when my downstairs neighbor comes out and starts calling me names and stomping on my fingers. And so I fall, I'm assuming to my death, and I land in some fairly soft bushes. And so I'm scratched up and I'm, I'm poked here and there, but I'm alive. And so I'm hugely relieved. And as I'm trying to dig myself out of the bushes, I look up and my neighbor is trying to tip his refrigerator off his balcony on top of me. And before I can get out of the bushes, his fridge falls and I wake up here. And Peter said, she, you know, kind of nods like he's heard it all before. And he says, you were completely innocent. Come on in. So he gets to come in. The next guy in line steps up and having heard nothing from the guy before, hears the rules and starts to tell his story. He says, I come home from work in the middle of the day. I'm going to surprise my wife. I've gotten flowers and we're going to have lunch together. I'm really excited to spend lunch with the love of my life. And I and I get in the, house, in the apartment and she is wearing makeup and provocative clothing and looks guilty as sin. And I know she's cheating on me. So I start digging through the apartment. I look under the bed, I look behind the curtains, I look everywhere and I, and I can't find anybody. And all of a sudden I look out on my balcony and I see fingers. <laughs> and so I run out there and I start calling him names and I'm stomping on his fingers and, and, and he falls and I'm delighted. And then I notice he lands in some bushes and the guy's not even dead. And so I go looking around my apartment for something to throw at him, and I can't find anything, so I grab the fridge, and I'm shoving and pulling and tugging, and the thing's unusually heavy, and, and I get it over the balcony, and with everything in me, I tip this thing over the balcony and drop it on him, and, and, uh, which was a lot, because I'm not in great shape, and before I even have a second to register the fact that I've got pain in my chest and my left arm, before I even realize I'm having a heart attack, I wake up here. And Peter <laughs> says, you know, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, downstairs. So the guy looking disgruntled and misunderstood heads for the stairs. Third guy in line steps up and having not heard anything from the previous two, hears the rules and starts his story. So I'm hiding out in this fridge. <laughs> I learned that joke in sixth grade. I remember exactly where I was standing when I learned that joke. <laughs> that was one of my favorites for a long time. And believe it or not, we're going to talk about that joke later. <laughs> we're continuing our summer series this morning titled Acts Like a Christian, um, where we're studying the book of Acts, not so much as a history book of the amazing things that the early church did as they began this movement that we're still a part of today, but rather we're taking kind of an overview, survey look at... Uh, to continue what we've been doing this year of looking at what a resurrected life is supposed to look like. Um, to answer this kind of question from, from 2021 of, of what does it mean to live a Christian life? And, uh, and so believing that Jesus died for us and then rose again, crushing death and giving us access to God and to our own souls and to others 
and to even the earth and our vocation and purpose, in light of that amazing news, how should we alter our lives? What should change? What, what should be different about us? What does living a resurrected life look like? We started this series by looking at the way the disciples moved from followers, or you could even say spectators of Jesus, to suddenly being left alone with this enigmatic command to wait, wait for something big. And even though they couldn't just charge forward with their plans to advance this kingdom and to announce that the king was on the throne, they did immediately get to some really serious business, kind of revealing that they were no longer spectators. They're now full participants in the gospel movement. So the first thing we have to look at, look at in this series is that our faith is participatory. This is not a spectator faith. Then in week two, we looked at Pentecost as the Holy Spirit enters the story and how uh, being overwhelmed with the presence of God, the apostles' very first instinct was to share their faith. They left the beautiful comfort of God's tangible presence. They could have just stayed in that upper room and basked in the, in the presence of God, but they, they left that place to confront some, some curious and needy people who wanted to know what was up, and they shared their faith with him. And then last week, Reg uh, read this short, almost snapshot type picture that Luke gives us of what this kind of new life looks like. Talked about how they were listening to the apostles teaching and they were spending time together. They were eating together. Like we said, they were praying together and sharing what they had with one another. It's this gorgeous picture of real community. Well, this week we're going to just kind of move straight on in the story with like Luke told it to the very next part. So if you want to follow in your own Bible or app, we'll be in Acts chapter three. If not, the words will be behind me. Or if you're joining online, they'll be right in the middle of your screen. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. After they approached the temple, a lame man from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful. He was, uh, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at this, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. <clears throat> when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we made this man walk with our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you did and your leaders did uh, to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God is, was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until the time is finally, the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to the prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets 
and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through the, your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of your backs, each of you back from your sinful ways. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, before we dive in too deep, uh, I do want to kind of zoom out a little bit and refocus on the purpose of this letter. We talked about this the first week. Luke is writing to this guy named Theophilus. Uh, and based on how thoroughly this book will eventually just kind of focus in on Paul, it kind of becomes Paul's story after a while. At the beginning, he's telling a story about this guy and this guy and everything that's going on. And then he just kind of zooms in on Paul and just follows Paul for the rest of the book. Uh, it's likely that, that what Luke was doing here was writing to his Roman patron, trying to secure some support for Paul, who is now imprisoned in Rome. By the end of the book, Paul will be imprisoned in Rome, and most likely Theophilus was sending, or uh, Luke was sending this stuff to Theophilus, because back then the prison didn't feed you and take care of you. You had to have people bring you food and stuff. They just locked you up. Somebody had to support you while you were in there. So most likely Luke was trying to secure some support for Paul. Um, and I think this is important because it, it kind of informs this morning's story a little bit. Um, because at the end of that little snapshot that Luke gives, uh, that Reg read us last week, it says this, A deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. So it seemed like there was a lot of this stuff going on, a lot of signs and wonders. Um, in fact, we're going to read in a couple of weeks where they were just pulling people out on the streets, hoping that they would get healed by, by the apostles as they walked by. I mean, there's a lot of this going on, which begs the question, why does Luke tell us this story? Why does he give us details on this story over all those other ones? Um, and to answer that, I think we have to tiptoe into next week's sermon just a little bit. Um, Peter gets in trouble for this sermon. Like he gets called in by the authorities. He gets questioned, like, what in the world are you doing? Um, and so I think what Luke is trying to kind of highlight here is, uh, is this kind of juxtaposition between the good that the apostles were doing and the trouble they were getting into by the authorities. Um, so he, he picks this story because this story has a backlash. Um, while telling philosophy the Jesus story and the early church story, he keeps stressing the kind of good that the church is doing. They're blessing people. They're healing people. They're doing amazing things. They're changing the trajectory of people's lives, and they're being mistreated for it. Because it's very likely that Theophilus, and we're all a little guilty of this, if he heard Paul was in prison, he might have thought, well, he had to do something wrong. You know, to get, people don't just get thrown in prison for no reason, right? We all kind of have that, you know. And, uh, and so I think what Luke might be doing here is going, this is the kind of stuff we're being thrown in prison for, for actually helping people. So, so I think this story, it's important to keep the big picture in mind to understand why Luke chose this one. And this little goofy bit of context about Theophilus and, and the letter, I think is important this morning because it shows us how important the whole story is, how important it is to get the big picture. Sometimes we zoom in so close, we miss the grand narrative, which I think is really important to hold um, uh, in tension. Uh, just like the guy that had the heart attack in my story, really important to have all the information. I told you I was going to bring it back. The reason that Luke wrote Theophilus can greatly affect the way we read the book of Acts, um, especially particular passages that we don't fully understand. And I think this is especially important as we eavesdrop on Peter's sermon because uh, Peter's sermon makes more sense if we widen out and look at the purpose of the entire Old Testament. And so we're going to do that this morning. Peter starts out his sermon this way. Peter saw his opportunity to address the crowd. People of Israel... Why are you so, why is this so surprising or what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we have made this man walk by our own power and godliness? First, this doesn't really bear on this sermon, but I love that Peter does this here. Um, I think more preachers could stand to do this. Uh, why are you staring at us as though it's our power or godliness? I think this is an important thing for us to remember. Uh, it is so easy, especially when you're doing pretty good at living the good Christian life, to start to think some of this hinges on your own obedience and godliness. Um, and Peter knows that's not the fact. I mean, you got to remember, it was just like a couple weeks ago, Peter, you know, completely denied Jesus. And so Peter is acutely aware that this has nothing to do with his obedience, right? He knows it is not only Jesus's power, but Jesus's godliness 
that does all of this. This all hinges on him. But anyway, the sermon continues. Um, For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all of our ancestors, who brought glory to his son Jesus by doing this. Peter actually goes on to make several references to the Old Testament, from the Adam and Eve story by calling Jesus the author of life, to Moses and Samuel and all the prophets. He kind of tells this sermon that is really all about the Old Testament. It is really all he does here. And in the midst of that, he makes this strange statement. Then the times of refreshment will come. And this is where we're at a bit of a disadvantage as Gentile Christians 2,000 years removed is because those readers, those writers and speakers were able to make one little statement and in it is all this context that everybody would have understood that we have a tendency to to miss. So what I want to do is a little bit of nerd work here and try to get a bigger picture of what was going on when a first century Jew like these guys read the Old Testament. What was going on when they read it? What did they hear? What did they see? Peter leans really heavily on the Old Testament in this message. And just like knowing Luke's purpose for this book can change the way we read it, knowing the purpose of the Old Testament can actually change the way we read this beautiful collection of stories. The first thing to know is that no Jew would ever call this the Old Testament. Even like Messianic Christian Jews get a little offended by that term because they feel like old speaks of like worn out or replaced or you know, kind of the, the has-been testament, and they would never look at it that way. They call it the Tanakh, which, uh, which isn't even actually a word. It's an acronym um, that stands for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, T-N-K, Tanakh. So it's an abbreviation that they pronounce, Tanakh. The Torah, the T, is the first five books of the Bible. We usually refer that refer to that as the law. So it's the first five books. The Ketuvim is a Hebrew word that just means the writings, that's Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Okay, those, those are the, the writings. The fascinating part, though, is the Nevi'im, which is the, the prophets. The Nevi'im is the Hebrew word that means the prophets. And this collection that they call the prophets includes Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and then... Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all the minor prophets, what we think of as the prophets. So when they talk about the prophets, they put what we Gentiles tend to call the history books. Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel. And there's almost nothing prophetic in those books. They're just history. And the reason this is interesting is because Um, is because of when they were put together. If you want to know what the Old Testament is about, you have to imagine this completely distraught and confused group of rabbis sitting around in Babylon. Imagine the unimaginable, the unthinkable has just happened. I don't even know what to compare this to, but it would be something like waking up tomorrow morning and finding out that China had taken over America. And, And you're hearing it in the news. We are now part of the Chinese empire. And the constitution is null and void. Any freedoms you grew up with and expect are now gone. Um, and and there, there is no legal recourse for this. And, and it is announced that, that if you try to do anything about it, not only the Chinese military, but the American military will kill you. And so welcome to China. You are now in China, period. That is something like what the Jews would have felt when they went into captivity. Like this, this unthinkable reality had just happened. And, and they're sitting there trying to figure out what on earth was going on. This type of disconcerted confusion and complete disorientation is probably about as close as we can get to understanding what they were feeling when Babylon conquered Israel. Because we read the Old Testament as though it's this kind of nice, clean, chronological picture of God saving his people, uh, his people disobeying him, God sending prophets to warn them, they don't obey, and they get taken into captivity. It's, it's pretty. It wouldn't have been that way for them. They would have had, number one, um, it would have been very unlikely that uh, any of them would have had access to the scriptures. They were, number one, they were just this kind of pile of random scrolls. They re- weren't really compiled clean like we have them. They were, and a lot of them were not true. A lot of them were, were false. They were just things that people wrote and, and put down. And, uh, and so 
what they really had, it, it, they wouldn't have had the Bible like we have the Bible. What they really had was this kind of overshadowing ethos that they're the people of God. That's, that's really what drove them mostly. They're the good guys. That's all they really knew. Like they don't have, they can't quote scripture and verse quite like we can. They're just the good guys. And they had these oral stories that were told over and over and over again that they knew and they could recite. But they didn't have the text. So if they're in a Western, they get to wear the white hats. Everybody else wears black. That's, that's the reality they lived with. They, they had this attitude that they're special. This is why Elijah, when Elijah confronts Ahab, Elijah's one of the big heroes of the Old Testament to us. Ahab is one of the villains. When they meet each other, Ahab calls Elijah the, tr- the troublemaker of Israel. There you are, the troublemaker of Israel. Because he thought he was a good guy. He had no clue. When we read it, he's like the devil. He's the bad guy. Ahab had no idea. He's an Israelite. He just assumes he's a good guy. And this prophet who keeps talking bad about us is clearly the bad guy. It's also why when King Josiah, David's great-grandson, decides to clean up the temple, he bumps into a, a copy of one of the scrolls, most likely Deuteronomy, and he had never heard it before. He's a king of Israel. And he's like, I had no idea this is what we were supposed to be doing. And he starts this revival because a king of Israel had never heard the Bible. So this, what they got passed down was this feeling of being God's special people. That's really all they had. And occasionally a radical preacher would come along and say, you guys are off track, you're, you're getting lost, God's going to judge you, and, and things are going off the rails. But it was fairly easy to ignore them because there was also plenty of people saying, you're all good, everything's great, God loves you, everything's super. Really easy to ignore that kind of street preacher when there's puppies on Instagram and a new dance on TikTok. Like it's, you know, (laughs) plenty to do. But then the unthinkable happens and Babylon conquers Israel and, and takes them captive and tears down God's temple. Nothing like that had ever happened since the Exodus and nobody imagined it could. It wasn't supposed to be able to. And so nobody gets it, except it did happen. So this takes us back to this group of confused rabbis who managed to gather up the scrolls and take them to Babylon with them. And they're sitting there with piles of scrolls trying to sort them out. What just happened? You obviously throw out all the writings that said nothing bad could ever happen to Israel because those guys weren't telling the truth. Those were false prophets. So those get ditched immediately. And you just keep hunting. And you find this guy named Isaiah. And some of you can kind of remember him, but none of you really listened to him. He was, he was kind of out there. Except as you read his stuff, you realize he predicted this moment. And not just like vaguely, like really specifically, a hundred years before it happened, told what was about to happen. And so this guy's clearly a true prophet. And so now you're like, you really want to know what this guy said because not only did he predict this captivity, but the whole second half of his book was talking about what was going to happen after the captivity. And there was hope in it. And there was beauty in it. And there was God's going to restore us in it. And since the first half was proven to be true, you have a lot of reason to believe the second half. Right? And so you, so you, you get into this story of Isaiah and you start to read his stuff. And it's cool because God predicted it, but it's also a little embarrassing because you didn't listen to him when he spoke the first time. So that's kind of nagging at you a little bit. But you need that hope that's in the second half of the book. And so you study, right? You study because Isaiah talks about this time of refreshment. Remember Peter's sermon? When Peter says, this is the time of refreshment. Like if you'll repent, that's the time of refreshment. Isaiah mentions that. So Isaiah was not only proven to be a good and true prophet who rightly predicted the fall of Judah long before it happened, but his book has hope, which grips the rabbis. And so they start to dig in and they find out that most of his writing hinges on this heir of David. Isaiah talks about this heir all the time, this heir of David. And so you start to dig and you find scrolls that tell this David story. And so you, you, you walk backwards from Isaiah and you, and you wind up in First and Second 
kings. And, and you're learning about David who, who was saved as a young boy and, and God gives this man a promise that he's going to have an heir forever. And that's important because this informs Isaiah. And so you need this David story to, to tell the Isaiah story. And, and, and from David, this, you walk back to, to Samuel who anointed David, who was the last of the judges. So you got to know what judges were. So you, you walk back through the story of judges and it's because the judges informed Samuel who anointed David who informs Isaiah. And Samuel is, is the, the last of the judges and the first of the judges is Joshua. And so you got to tell the story of, of how Joshua went into the land. And, and, and so all of this to them is prophetic. It's all part of the prophet story. And ultimately it walks all the way back from, from Moses to to Joseph and how he wound up in Egypt and, and, and Abraham, the, the progenitor of the whole thing and back through Noah's son, Shem and all the way back to Adam and Eve. And it all started with these guys going, we need hope. So before they were done, they've got all these scrolls pieced together this narrative that runs from Adam through Abraham and all the promises made to him and through Moses and all the promises made to him and through David and all the promises made to him. All the way to exactly where you're sitting on that day. It walks, they, they found the scrolls and walked it from Adam all the way to their table. So first... It's amazing because you can, you can totally see where you are, why you are where you are. Oh yeah, this is why we're in Babylon. Now I get it. Every story seems to explain how Israel failed and the people of God the, were called, who they were called to be, they failed at that. And that's why they're in captivity. But the second thing that it reveals is how faithful God has been for so long. And that he sees beyond this current affliction into a bright and glorious future based on his faithfulness. So the story is not over. So these rabbis begin to consolidate and package these stories. They tell of how Moses sent spies into the land, and, but they were scared so they had to wander for 40 years until the next generation could go in and conquer. So the people enter the land and, and they, they win for a while, but then they start to get tired and they don't clear out everybody. Which, which leaves this seed of this is why there was, there was the temptation to worship other gods because they didn't clear out everybody. That's an important piece of the story if you want to understand Isaiah. That they didn't get everybody out of the land like they were supposed to. And the rabbis tell how, how in this environment surrounded by all these worshipers of other gods, the judges who were supposed to be ruling Israel just got worse and worse and worse. Man, when you read Judges, First couple guys aren't too bad. By the time you get to Samuel, you're like, does this guy even believe in God? I don't, not Samuel, Samson. You're like, I don't even know if this guy, like, he's a terrible example to follow. And, and the prophets, the, 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 or these rabbis, they drop in these lines that tell us so much. Four times at the end of the book, they say, in those days, Israel had no king and all the people did whatever was right in their own eyes. So you can see these rabbis setting up the David story like way early, like, and this is why we needed a king. They're telling one story. So they put together these scrolls that go through the Samuel story and how the nation was moved to choose a king and get consolidated into one nation. It includes this beautiful story of this young boy, this God worshiper who God chooses because of his heart, not because he's tall or strong, or, but because of his heart. And then this promise that God gives this king of an heir. And then he tells about the kind of pride and lasciviousness of his son Solomon, which just kind of starts this downward spiral that leads right to the table where they're sitting and writing. To a Jew, Joshua is a prophetic book because it informs Isaiah by explaining why there was still idol worship in the land. Judges is a prophetic book because it informs Isaiah by explaining how this sinful nation looked before it had a king. Samuel and Kings inform Isaiah by explaining God's promises to David and how the king 
the kings after David failed to, to, to keep up with God and, and explains their own life right now. If you don't read the Old Testament from the perspective of a Jew sitting in captivity, trying to make sense of your life, then you're likely to misread a lot because it was all written to explain how in the world they got here. Why is the book of Ruth recorded? It's really just the story of one girl. Like it's kind of a weird story in the great context, except she's David's great grandmother. And it's really important that David be told this. Why is Esther in there? God's never even mentioned in the book of Esther. Except if you're a Jew in captivity, the fact that in captivity, God saved his people from Naaman becomes really important. You really want that book to be told because it proves that God's provision and protection is not linked to the land. He will even protect you when you're in captivity. So they want that story. The whole book, the whole Old Testament is informed by this desire to explain why everything is so broken. To a Jew, the purpose for the writing of and arrangement of the Tanakh is to offer explanation for and hope in the midst of exile, brokenness. Or to put it in a language that we're more familiar with at Open Table Community Church, these rabbis saw themselves in the story of God. They didn't study the Bible as a history of what God did. They studied it as an explanation for what God is doing in their life right now. It was not okay for this to be a story about those people back there. They studied it and put it together and understood it as, as something that applies to my life in this moment. Now, obviously, in contemplating the motivations of the rabbis who sat in exile, piecing together, or what we call canonizing the Old Testament, I do need to point out a couple things. First, they did not rush this process. This was not like a, we got to figure this out, you know. It, it, it was a multi-generational process. The Torah, the first five books, was canonized in about 400 B.C., uh, enough that Ezra, when he came back to the land in 350, he had a copy of the Torah, the, the first five books. So that was kind of locked in around 400 BC. The Nevi'im, the prophets, weren't actually canonized for like another 200 years as they continued to piece together this story that explained their existence. And the, the Ketuvim, the writings, actually weren't even canonized till 100 AD, like after Jesus. So this was a long process, very scholarly. This is not something they did you know, with a lot of coffee and cold pizza. Like this is, this is something they took their time on and, and really um, spent some process in. Um, so don't, even though I make it sound like they were desperate to find this answer, it, it wasn't a rushed process. It was a very slow process. Second is all this focuses on the human pursuit of putting together this, uh, the, the scripture. But I do believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit was active and moving and inspiring this entire process to see to it that the scripture was compiled in a way that rightly communicates the gospel message. So I, I'm not leaving the Holy Spirit out of this process, but I do want to think about the human piece of this. What was going on in these rabbis' minds? Because I desperately believe they saw themselves in the story of God. They couldn't imagine a Bible that didn't explain their current situation. If it doesn't say something to me today, right now, then it's not the right scripture. They couldn't imagine a Bible that didn't explain today. Looking back at the great stories about the mighty things that God did back there was not good enough. They were not satisfying with knowing that God did great things for their ancestors. They needed to know that God's story was for them too. That God wasn't the God of yesterday, but of today and tomorrow. Now, having spent way too long on the nerd work, let's go back to this morning's passage. Peter is on his way to the temple and sees a beggar. And Peter can take this two ways. He can see himself as outside the story of God, or he can see himself as in the story of God. Here's what I mean by that. Peter can see this brokenness. And obviously, it's an obviously underprivileged man. And he can say, man, if Jesus was the son of God, and he's risen, and God loves us the way Jesus said he does, then why is there still such evil in the world? 
Like if, if Jesus is who he's supposed to be, if God himself walked on earth, shouldn't things be better? Shouldn't the arrival of Messiah have changed things? Peter could have asked those questions. How many of you have asked those questions? I've asked those questions. So you can only really judge and analyze the story of God if you're standing outside of it. And you compare it to other stories and other narratives and other worldviews. Yeah, if it's true, then. But Peter has another option. He can see himself as in the story of God. And rather than wonder why on earth Jesus didn't do something or doesn't do something, why in the world does all this still exist? Peter can go, hey, I don't have any money, but I'm part of this story where we're trying to fix broken things. How about we start with you? Gold and silver have I not, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. Because that's the story I'm a part of. This whole thing is my story. So when a crippled beggar is jumping and leaping and praising God and the crowd is gathering to try and figure out what in the world is going on, what else could Peter say other than this is the story? This is the whole story. This is... This is what it was told for, for this moment. This isn't God doing a new thing or a crazy thing or another thing. This is the story. The story of Moses and Samuel and Isaiah and Jesus and today. In fact, Peter basically puts this crowd right in the same seat that those exiled rabbis sat in. The ones who canonized the Tanakh or at this point, they just called it the Law and Prophets. Peter referred to that. I mean, Jesus referred to the Law and Prophets. Those are the only ones that have been canonized at this point. It's not really the full Tanakh, because there's no... It's tnn. <laughs> Listen to what Peter says. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, Anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke of what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets. See yourself in the story of God. Peter basically tells them this is their story. He says, stop talking about this story like it's an old fairy tale, like it's something that happened. You stand right now at this moment in the story that the prophets spoke of. This is not a story you tell. This is a story you live. Peter, while seeing himself in the story of God, invites others into the story. And to see the results of that message, we kind of have to tiptoe back into next week's passage. It says, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. So Peter started his story with a crippled beggar and ended it with 2,000 more believers. And that's what I want to lean into this morning. People in this story, Peter in this story takes a bad situation and he reframes it into an opportunity. And he leverages that opportunity to lead 2,000 people to Jesus. I say 2,000 because Peter's first sermon, 3,000 got saved. So we're assuming now being 5,000. I can do math. <laughs> Think about this. Peter gets to the, to the temple right at the time they're dropping off this crippled guy who regularly begs there. Be honest. How many of you have ever felt the stress of that stoplight with the person on the corner and you're like, oh, don't put me right up front. Don't put me right up front. Come on. Yeah. We've all done that. My daughter, Grace, who works with me uh, a lot of time, cannot handle that moment. She, she like announces when we're back up, she's like, if you stop us at the stoplight, you will either give him money or I'm getting out of the car. Like, she just tells me, I cannot handle it. I cannot handle that moment. I can't do it. So either you, give, you find something to give him. In fact, one day a friend of mine posted um, on, I think it was Citizens for the Future of Gardener or something, um, a picture of this lady who was panhandling, I think, at Walmart. 
and I said, hey, please don't give this person money. I know them. This is a scam. And I'm, I'm flipping through Facebook. Grace looking over my, over my shoulder. She goes, oh, man, I gave her 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Esther and I used to eat at the old spaghetti factory. Anybody remember the old spaghetti factory? Am I like super dating myself right now? Fairly often, and there used to be this, this homeless guy that just a little bit down from the restaurant um, who, would, who, would, who would beg on the sidewalk. And this is before like debit cards and we all just had money on us all the time. There was more than once that I gave him like our dinner money and we had to go find something else to do. And so Esther started giving me an allowance. Like when we go to the old spaghetti factory, here's what you're allowed to give the guy. Stop giving him our whole dinner money. Well, Peter's in one of those awkward situations. He gets to the temple and he, he gets there just when they're dropping this guy off. He doesn't have any money on him. You guys ever have that one now that we do have debit cards? When you almost want to roll the window down and go, dude, if I had cash, I would give it to you. I just, just a debit card. Sorry. Yeah. I use, do you take Google Pay? Like, <laughs> Peter gets there right when the guy gets there. He's got no money on him. It's a terribly uncomfortable situation. And yet Peter takes this uncomfortable situation and turns it into 2,000 new believers. I believe the reason he was able to do this is because of one word used twice. Peter and John looked at the beggar. They saw him. And then Peter saw his opportunity. Peter saw. He had his eyes open. I think this is the key to this whole story. How easily could Peter have walked right past this beggar? I mean, he was going to pray in the temple and, and Jews had set times for prayer. He, he, he could have said, dude, I'm late. I got to get. We can talk later. I have things, I have places to be. I'm busy. He did not, nobody would have faulted him for not having time to stop and talk to this beggar. Peter easily could have focused all of his attention on God. This is prayer time. When he went into the temple, he could have spent his whole time worshiping God. God just did an amazing miracle. He could have ignored everybody and been like, God, thank you so much for healing that dude. Just, just me and God. But he saw a crowd. He saw people who, who, who were begging for an explanation of what just happened. No one would have faulted Peter if he'd walked right past the beggar. No one would have faulted Peter if he chose to, to actually pray during prayer time. Spending time with God. Except Peter had his eyes open. Anybody else pray with their eyes open? I always have prayed with my eyes open. Not because I'm good, but because when I close my eyes, my mind wanders. It's weird. I get more distracted with my eyes closed. I'm daydreaming. I'm in a whole other place. I have to keep my eyes open so I can stay focused. Isn't that weird? I don't know. ADD is awesome. Peter's eyes were open. He looked at a beggar and he saw an opportunity. He looked at a crowd and he saw hungry people who needed Jesus. But mostly, Peter saw himself in the story of God. So how do we respond to this? First of all, we never see the whole story. We have super limited vision. Like each of the players in my opening joke, we only see our little piece. I'm going to get the most out of it. But if there's one huge lesson from this book, it's the beauty of living with the Holy Spirit. Because we get to follow and trust that God does see everything. He sees way more than we do. And we just need to obey his leading. But even though we don't see as much as we would like, we can still greatly benefit in the kingdom of God if we simply have our eyes open and see ourselves in the story of God. Last week, Reg talked about ways we could reach out to the drivers who are right outside our front door every Sunday morning. I got bombarded with texts 
Sunday afternoon. What if we put up a sign? What if we did this? What if we did this? People just, and all I think it was, was Reg said, hey, look, see. And the second we looked, we were like, holy crap. I almost said it, Judy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> look at all the people out there. Most of us walk out of here and we walk straight to the car and we go to lunch. We walked out last Sunday and saw an ocean of trucks. And we were like, whoa. And we need more of that. What would like life look like if we had our eyes open? So what's going on in your world right now? What opportunities are sitting right in front of you, waiting for you to see them? Who needs a meal? Who needs a hug? Who needs to go out for a coffee? Who needs to hear you say, I don't have much, but I'll give you what I have. See, there's two ways we can live our lives. We can spend every day <clears throat> just getting through the day. Work and sleep, work and sleep, rinse and repeat. And from that hamster wheel, you can look out at the story of God and criticize it. If God's all powerful and all loving, why is there so much evil in the world? Work and sleep, work and sleep, rinse and repeat. Or you can change your perspective. Like we sang this morning, you can say, Jesus, be thou my vision. You can look at your life, really look and see your life and say, I'm part of a story that is so much bigger than work and sleep, work and sleep. How am I going to advance the kingdom today? How am I going to add to this story in my workplace today? How am I going to leverage an opportunity that's in an ordinary thing into a God thing this week? Where do I see opportunities to help usher in times of refreshment? Because that's what the world desperately needs is people who will do that. So the way I would love to respond to this message is to open your eyes and see yourself in the story of God. This story is supposed to be so much more than work and sleep and work and sleep, rinse and repeat. In fact, I hope this message nags at you. That's what I hope. I hope if you leave this place and drive right back into your normal business as usual, I hope in the back of your mind, there's now an itchy little bug that said, what if I live for more? What if this Jesus story is actually supposed to be my story? I hope it, drive, I hope it drives you crazy. <laughs> That's my desire. I hope it makes you nuts. I believe that God is moving an open table right now. I think if we as a church were to begin to actually believe that these crazy stories from this 2,000-year-old book called Acts, stories like Peter healing a guy and preaching to a crowd about it, that these stories are actually the way resurrection people are supposed to live. I think if we could believe that, God's going to use this little ragamuffin group of people to majorly impact this city and our workplaces and this whole area and, and our families for Jesus. Amen? Let's go to the table.